I'm Heidi Zuckerman. I've spent my life connecting people to art to make their lives better. This podcast talks about art in contemporary culture and why we should care. Each episode is an impactful conversation with people I find interesting and think you will too about their life, values, and always about why they think art matters. This is Conversations About Art. Richard Betts passed the Court of Master Sommelier's master's exam on the first attempt, only the ninth person to ever do so. He co-founded the wine labels Betts & Scholl in 2003 and Scarpetta in 2006 and founded Sombra Mezcal also in 2006. Today, Richard spends his time guiding Sombra Mezcal, Astral Tequila, and his newest wine project, An Approach to Relaxation. Richard is the New York Times best-selling author of The Essential Scratch and Sniff Guide to Becoming a Wine Expert and The Essential Scratch and Sniff Guide to Becoming a Whiskey Know-It-All. We discuss the long-term effects of nurture, a deep-seated fear of failure, when he proposed to his wife, how it feels to give back, his tattoos, and working at the intersection of enthusiasm and opportunity. I actually take a lot of inspiration in in the idea that you chose Amsterdam uh, without working there, but because you travel, right? You said you can kind of live anywhere you want. Anywhere we want with a good airport. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We love it. I mean, one of the, even just in this time now, (laughs) strange as it is, it really reinforces all the reasons that we want to be here. Um, principally that people are happy. And, you know, when, when we first moved here, that was apparent to us, but we didn't understand all the underlying causes of that. Um, and over the last three years, we've, we've begun to tap into what those are. Um, you know, and there's simple things like everyone rides their bike or they walk and, you know, you don't deal with all that, that pressure. Um, the town's totally cute and it's tiny and I mean, look, this is from my home. You're looking, that's the Dutch East India Company warehouse from 1643, the still, I think, wealthiest corporation in the history of the world. It's pretty crazy. The, I don't know if you can see it that well, but out there is the eye, the big body of water. Um, so it's cute and beautiful, but also the place works. You know, there's a real, I mean, if you want to go to college, it's free. If you want to go to college after you retire, it's free again. If you need to go to the doctor, that's free. Health, I mean, your monthly, even us as expats is 100 bucks a month for your health insurance. And when you do go to the doctor, it's still free. Medications are free. If When you retire, there's actually going to be money. Um, minimum wage is something like 17 euros and change per hour. So you can do any job and, like, have dignity. Um and then with that, there's a, there's a real sense of the collective good. And um, it's nice, you know, some of our sarcastic acquaintances, like, oh, it's socialism. It's like, it's not socialism. It's a very, very different thing. Um, there's just care for one another and different values. Um, and it's a mature society that's had a lot of time to, to figure it out and learn from their mistakes. And, um, and now in this obviously very strange time, we're we have a quarantine, but it's just safe social distancing. You know, we can go out, do whatever you want to do other than go to restaurants and have close proximity with other people, but they, they trust you to be an adult. And that's, that's just huge. And that's really amazing. My sister and her husband and kids, they live in Copenhagen. He's uh, Danish and there are similarities, I think. Definitely. This, I'm really compelled by this idea of a mature society and Mm -hmm. what that means. And I'm also interested in the idea of what it means to be a mature person and how to make mature choices. Yep. It's pretty wild, isn't it? I think that's kind of the whole mission, you know? Yeah. I think a lot about the idea of the, the word like appropriate, you know, Mm -hmm. when I was building the Aspen art museum, I wanted to build, something that I thought was appropriate to Aspen in terms of 
how much money was spent and its size and the materials and and but I think the word appropriate or the word mature they can sort of be a little bit interchangeable here it just means about being personally responsible for your impact yeah I agree yeah and I think that that's something that's going to hopefully people reevaluate on their own now but um they're going to be forced to reevaluate whether they want to or not, which is interesting. And I think, you know, when we do reevaluate our impact, you also then sort of hopefully reevaluate what's the point of the whole thing, you know? And I don't know, we've done, I've done, we all do it on our own, I suppose. Um, but some deep thinking on that and what, you know, what is the point and for us? It's to have fun and spread love and spread smiles and that that's kind of it you know we're not trying to accumulate or conquer or amass or any of those sorts of things it's it's just experience based and handing it back you know so that's been a, a very refreshing reorientation of of life when you think about what matters and i really appreciate your succinct articulation of, of what matters to you. Mm -hmm. And I feel that from what I know of you, you're doing what you say you want to do. And yeah. so there's, there's no gap there. I sometimes yeah. find that people say something and do something else. And, and so they're kind of out of integrity or out of alignment. Mm -hmm. uh, but with that really specific idea of what matters, how did you get there? Um, you know, that's a that's a good question. That I, I think for me, it started with lots of small data points through my early life, um, and some of those are. Um, I mean, even if I just go back to my my first elementary school, kindergarten you know, through sixth. And that was an amazing experience for me. Um, I grew up in Tucson, Arizona, when it was a very small town. Um, the Sonoran Desert was a whole lot bigger than it is now. Now there are a whole lot more houses on it, but that is what it is. It's, the, the world is growing. Um, but my mom and dad had just moved there from uh, upstate New York, and my mom's uh, real hope was that I would you know, grow up amongst all kinds of kids and not okay, the best school we can afford or whatever. She's like, no, you're going to go to public school and you're going to go to one right in the middle of Tucson. And so my friends were largely, um, well, at that point, um, called Papago, now called Tohono Odom, or Mexican or African-American, um, and a couple of Caucasian kids. But, you know, it was a, it was a big mix of, of everybody. And I think even more importantly, um, you know, it was... Uh, economically, you know, very, very depressed school. And so, you know, you, you, you really, in hindsight, understand the, the value of nurture. You know, there's this age-old question of nature versus nurture. And for me, it's really almost overwhelmingly all about nurture. Um, and I was very fortunate to have, have parents that, that loved and cared and and you know, they both worked their butts off. And my mom, two jobs, and my dad, his full time job, and um, and and they had lots of love and support for my sister and I. But all of my friends at school, not all, but seventy percent, eighty percent, at that first school didn't have any of that. And so, you know, on the school ground, we were all equal, and in the classroom, gaps started to form. And then, you know, it's it's. It is what it is academically for a minute, but then, you know, kids get bigger and trouble shows up and responsibilities are required, but they're not attended to. And, um, you know, I had one very, very close friend. And in fact, I was just going through a box of photos there uh, recently and uh, found a photo from my sixth grade birthday. And I remember that birthday and there was a kid there um, that I'd been friends with for seven years at that point. And he went to my sister's room, and he got a Rubik's Cube and messed it up. You know, it was in order, and he put it out of order. And she she got really upset, and she's two years younger, and just yelled. And he cried, you know, as this, this moment. And then if you fast forward um, 
let's see, so seventh, eighth, ninth, three years from that moment, he's going to jail for life for beating someone to death over a cocaine debt. And you're just like, man, that's not who this kid is. You know, he just didn't have that opportunity. And, and you know, by seventh grade, uh, two of them were already dead. You know, by the by sophomore year in high school, you know, most of them had dropped out. And it was just heartbreaking. You know, these are your closest friends. And I really think when you're when you're young, you really do have your most innocent and close set of friends. And to see them all, um, you know, suffering and go through that and really just not have a chance at life is is truly heartbreaking. Um, and so it's something I'm spending more time thinking about now and how I can give back and hopefully um, you know, uh, contribute to making that, making that better. Um, but you know, we, we can talk about that or not. Um, but it's the, the, the point I, I want to make is that it, you know, this nurture thing is, is amazing, but it also, if you reflect upon yourself, like, okay, so for sure, you know, being born white male at this time in the United States is a gigantic advantage. I mean, it's huge, you know, even, even, you know, even just the male part's a huge advantage. And, and I have to recognize that. And then the, then the nurture um, that my sister and I see, if you recognize how, how, that, how special that is. But in that nurture, you also enjoy some privileges. Like at, at one point, um, you know, I would say, I don't mean this callously, but school was easy. You know, I, I, the, the thing about those group settings in, in public education is the class only moves as, slow as, the, as fast as the slowest person. And if you're not that person, well, then you can pretty much just like put it on autopilot. Um, and so, thing, so school was easy uh, for what it was. And I remember um, getting to my, I guess it was first year of high school, so ninth grade German class, eighth or ninth grade German class, um, with a woman named Mrs. Pritchard, who was a total bitch. I mean, pardon, can we swear? Is that okay? Yes, Sorry, of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she was a total bitch. She was horrible. And I walked in and she was just the most miserable person. And I knew at that point that this wasn't material to me. I didn't, I, I didn't have a long view of the world at that point, but it was like, okay, this is terrible. It's not fun. I'm not going to do it. And it's not going to matter. And I never went back. Um, and while that's a snotty privileged kid thing to do, you know, as a 11 year old or whatever you are at that age or at that, that grade, um, it was important because it just helped me understand like, oh, you, you can make choices. You know, you don't have to follow a path. And, you know, I'm not trying to sell it as over, overly rebellious either, but, but that, that moment did stick with me. And um, I found, you know, it, it stuck with me, but I, I didn't, you know, the next day have the lesson down. You know, it took me all the way through uh, a very expensive um, education, mostly funded by loans at Occidental College, to actually put that to practice. You know, and I got there and I was like, oh, I'm going to do um, biology, but I'll, you know, the classes were stacked with pre meds who were no fun. And so I really struggled. And I was going to do, I'm going to do economics. And I got to this class and I'm like, this is no fun at all. Like, you know, I didn't wear shoes until I actually went to school. I, I'm supposed to be outdoors and running around in the desert and catching lizards and all this stuff. And and I really struggled for for three years mightily. Um, I made the dean's blacklist, not not the good one, the bad one, where they say, Richard, you're not going to be able to spend more time with Occidental unless you get your act together. Um, and and so I took some time off. But I'm sort of stringing together a couple of decades of lessons, and I moved to Italy and just started doing what I wanted to do. And I found that when I do what I want to do, I do it well. And and I think that that's something that's true for all of us. Um, but having the impetus to leap and actually do what you want to do, that's a real thing. Um, you know, part of it, part of my impetus early on was privilege and nurture. And then later in college, it was, it was not so much the privilege, but it was, you know, for sure backed by nurture, but just total frustration and, and, um, you know, it was being at a loss for what to do and didn't know who it was and whatever. And, and so I jumped off the cliff for lack of something to do at all. Um, but in there, you know, there, there was the lesson that I found myself and, and, um, and embarked on the path to just do the stuff I wanted to do. Um, I mean, I, that, that wasn't an overnight thing. I still came back and finished at Occidental and then I still went into 
a graduate thesis in paleofluvial morphology with an eye on law school and, and got in and was planning to go when, um, you know, the sort of the, the, uh, I mean, the lessons are never complete, but they, they really, uh, took hold and I blew off the law school to get into food and wine, which is what I really wanted to do. Um, and then I, I would say, sorry, Heidi, this is a very long answer to your question. Um, but the, the last part that, that really sticks with me, and I'm, if I'm very honest with myself, um, it really, really mattered uh, and still matters, maybe less so. I hope, hopefully I'm conquering that demon a little bit, but um, a fear of failure is just gigantic. Um, and, you know, whenever I want to do, I want to, I don't want to use the word win because that it, it implies it comes at someone else's expense and that's never the point, but whatever I, I do, I want to do it as well as possible. Um, you know, society's set up in a way that you know, sometimes it does come with this idea of winning or whatever. And, and, and again, that's not my compass, but um, I, I just don't want to fail. And so that used to cause me a ton of stress, you know, and, and now, you know, once you have a few, um, positive experiences behind you, you know, they, first of all, they make you more comfortable, right? I mean, in, in so many ways, they make you more confident, they give you knowledge. Um, you know, I, I think if we're honest about it, it also gives you an, an economic opportunity to take your time and, and, and think about what you want to do next or and how you want to do it better than the last one. Um, but through all that, you also find some time to be quiet and yeah, you know, hopefully um, introspective and self-critical. Which I, I'm, I'm a fan of being self-critical. I don't, I'm not hard on myself. Like, oh, Richard, you should do ten more of those or eighteen more of those. And um, but I, I, I do hold myself accountable. And, and I think holding yourself accountable is a big, a big, big thing. Um, so yeah, I guess that's sort of the sum of it. Is, is, I mean seeing your friends die and be incarcerated and, you know, knowing that you have a chance and, and they didn't and you want to make something of it, but also knowing that life is short, um, figuring out what you like and just deciding you got to do it. I mean, today more than ever, right? It's like, you could be dead tomorrow. You could be dead in an hour. <laughs> you know, an asteroid could fall through this roof. Like, you know, that's very unlikely to happen, but and it's not to it's not to inspire fear, but it's to instead inspire happiness. Like you know, um, I, I don't wake up in the morning and think, "Oh, I have to do this." I wake up in the morning and think, "Oh, I get to do this." And you know what I did today? I, I got up this morning and I thought, "I get to do the first quarter expense reports." So I literally just spent five hours going through hundreds of receipts and piles, and yeah, it's just like, okay, it's not my most fun thing, but. You know, I'm, I'm drinking a margarita and I played some loud music and it beats being dead, doesn't it? <laughs> or, or jobless or homeless or, you know, lack of opportunity. You know, I'm doing expenses for a business I own. Like, that's cool. Like, I'm, I'm fortunate. So, yeah, I, I see it as, as really um, a point of privilege and, and fortune. It's so easy to look at someone else and think that the line – from you know, point A to point B is linear uh, mm -hmm. and that all of those decisions come from a place of self-confidence and courage. And yeah. that's more than often not the case. That, totally. that may be the, the story that, you know, people want other people to see yeah. if they're not being honest, Yep. but being able to have the generosity to share not just the loud voice that's in your head, but the quiet voice that's in your head mm -hmm. as yep. someone who has had success and the admiration of others and accomplishments that people look towards and admire, I think yeah. is, you know, maybe one of the most generous things to do. And the idea of your quiet voice talking about a fear of failure, mm -hmm. my quiet voice is, profound inadequacy yeah yeah and i don't know that that's what anyone would think about when they think of me but that's the voice that i have to contend with not every day not all day every day but in the darkest moments of yeah 
absolutely uncertainty and insecurity that's what comes up yeah no i i feel you completely and um what an intense feeling that must be for sure and and, and you know to varying degrees I, I think we all feel that um you know I, we've thought a lot about where we want to be on the planet and i don't i don't feel I, I want to say, like broadly speaking, it could tend to look more and more reclusive, <laughs> and that's not that's not it's not driven from a point of view of oh my god we hate people, um, but I think it, it's it's similar to I mean maybe it's our own our own expression of of this idea of adequacy and um, you know if you live if you have my job and you live in New York there are certain things expected of you you know you, there's you have to. You can have your own style, quote unquote, but it falls within a certain thing. You know, like we don't have to get too far into that, but you know, it, it, there is a certain um, expectation of you. Or if we go live in Los Angeles, there's a certain expectation of you. And I work in the beverage alcohol business now, and which is an extremely social business, and and the, that sociability manifests itself in different ways in different cities. Um, and we've thought deeply about that this is like, you know if we move to city x you know there's an expectation around again a professional world that would I, you know i, I want to use the word require and and not pigeonhole myself here but there is a certain requirement you know it's like okay I, i'm lucky i get to do what i want but it's it is a compromise you know i like to make things um and I can think of a lot of things I like to make. I also like to make pottery, um, but I can't make a living making pottery. <laughs> it's just, and I'm not going to try. You know, it's not that it's not that drastic. I also like to make tequila. It turns out I can make a living doing that. Um, but but within that, you know, we've thought, oh man, I just I don't want to go to the scene and then again be inadequate, be it dress or desire to socialize in a certain way or with certain people. That's a big one for us. Um, so, I, you know, I, I feel you. Um, and then, I, you know, I've definitely felt that in, in previous relationships in my life. And that's, that's been, um, you know, I, I was despondent in a, in a personal sense for the better part of a decade, you know. And, and, and that's tough, you know. It, it takes, that, that was with a personal relationship, and it takes two people to, to participate in that. Um, but it just wasn't working, and I... I kept wondering like what I was doing wrong. And then that despondency leads you to do all kinds of things that then later you're not proud of, you know, um, maybe they're not good for you physically. Maybe they're not good for you emotionally. Um, I like that we're talking about this, you know, everybody struggles, you know, we forget that you walk them down at mass and Avenue and everyone's dressed up and what have you, but you forget in that moment that, you know, everyone goes to the bathroom too. It's fine. It is what it is. Like we're all just human beings that we happen to, propped ourselves up in these funny ways right now. And that's just, it's not necessary. I think being able to give back and to share what matters mm. to you in a broad way is yeah. something that gives me great joy and brings meaning to my life. And yeah. I still don't know very much about wine, but I will credit any interest that I have in it to you. And Thank you. your yep, personal sharing with me about wine, something that matters to you uh, mm. in a way that was so specific and illustri- illustrative of more than just the taste, right? Mm-hmm. So the storytelling, uh, the yeah. smell, the sense of place. And yep. those are things that I look to art for also. You know, yeah. the storytelling, the sense of self, the sense of place. And I'd love to ask you to just talk a little bit about that. I mean, I'll never forget being in your former home in, in Aspen and, and having yeah. you have me smell some wine and say, doesn't it smell like smelly gym socks? And yeah. and I thought, what? Can, can yeah. wine smell like something that isn't, you know, pristine and perfect and highfalutin? Yeah. and I I love that we, I think, have in common this idea of trying to not necessarily democratize, but but show that 
access to art, wine, things that people have previously associated only with, say, an elite or yeah. um, a certain kind of people that even if it's not for everyone, it can be for anyone. Totally. That's well said, Heidi. I like that. Um, you know, I, I get asked this question, not the question you asked me, but um, the, the question I'm about to reiterate. Um, I get this question frequently. It's like, oh, you know, what's your favorite wine? Or an alternative <laughs> question is like, what's the best wine you had this year? And, um, you know, it's always the same answer, which is any wine that tastes like a place. And there's this French word, terroir. It's like terrier. You just flip the last two vowels. And um, that's a really lovely word that is meant to encompass everything about a place that makes the wine what it is. And so that includes some obvious things like the weather, um, the grape type, the soil, the aspect of the hill it may or may not grow on, you know, all these sorts of things, the type of farming. But it also includes things like, you know, maybe there's a pig farm upwind, you know, and it blows those sorts of things. Or perhaps more pleasantly, maybe there's, you know, miles and miles of lavender fields around, such as the case in the south of France. And all of those scents blow around and land on the grapes and they make their way into it. You know, they're, they're a variety of different, millions of different yeasts, actually, um, that, that all, I mean, just as a short tangent, there's yeast everywhere and we we don't really think about that because you can't see it, but all of us are covered in them at all times in our lives. But think about, you know, so that bio, you know, that, that microbiology is very specific to place and all of that goes in there. And why that matters to me is because without this idea of terroir, without this idea of place and the people that inhabit it, all the wine is the same, you know, and, and if it's all the same, it's boring, you know? So, if, if, it all, if it's all the same, then you only really need four wines, a red one, a white one, a pink one, and a sparkling one, because everything else is, is the same at that point. So it's the stories of, of, of the grapes that have an affinity for a place and the people that have an affinity for the grapes and the way they tend them and the way they celebrate them and the way that their lives are dedicated to them. You know, going back to the monks in Burgundy a thousand years ago, there's really an amazing and rich and, and thoughtful um, you know, history and, and shepherding of of these things to, you know, ideally the craft gets better and better. But as the craft gets better, I, I think that the art can also get better. And they're they're not linked. I don't want to say that craft and art are the same thing. They're not. But, um, you know, as you get better at your craft, it gives you an opportunity to maybe think more critically or more openly or maybe in a more free way about what else can be done or what you want to express um, and maybe you can express a certain attitude once you understand, once you have the tools to actually do it. You know what I mean? Does that make some sense? Yeah. So with works of art, I think that the the triangle, I always talk about the triangular relationship between the artist, the artwork, and the audience. Mm -hmm. So the person who is is looking at it or feeling it or being in it is super key. Yep. Does that happen with wine too? Do you bring oh yeah yeah very much it? so yeah totally um, you know it's uh, it, it totally matters and we just stood below the Kahinde Wiley sculpture in in uh, Virginia a month and a half ago and you know people are going by like it doesn't matter and it, it, I mean obviously it matters a lot and the placement of it matters a lot and that you know what is it Robert E Lee is on a similar sculpture half a mile away on the same boulevard that matters a lot and. You know, you've got to you've got to place yourself there and be willing to to um, be open to the story and the context and and have a desire to partake of it. Otherwise, it's not going to make any sense. And with wine, um, you know, there there are there are lots of little you know, bubbles of opportunity here, and and some of them, you know, what's the most delicious wine in the world? Well, well, here here comes the democracy part, which I know we don't want to have infect the whole thing. And I agree, it it isn't totally democratic, but I would say the best wine you've ever had is the one that makes you smile, you know? So just because I love something doesn't mean you're going to love it. Um, you know, and, and I think that my, my wife and I are actually on, on, we're only on the same page about 50% of the time in terms of what we like. Um, thankfully I'm choosing the wine tonight, but, um, it, it, there, that there is some democracy to that, but by the same token, you know, like if you look at these fabulously, regretfully now, but fabulously expensive 
red burgundies, you know, why are they fabulously expensive? You know, okay, yes, they've gotten popular because of critical opinion, but also there's really something to it. But if we, you know, sit down and open a 1945 Romanet Conti tonight, um, you know, which are only 700 bottles made 75 years ago or whatever it is, um, you know, you might just, you might not like it. You say, gosh, there's just no fruit. It's kind of tired. It smells kind of earthy and like leaves. But if you know the story and you know what it was and you've had 30 other vintages of this wine, like with all that context, it, it begins to matter. And so um, in the case of that wine, it's a very expensive and long process. In the case of um, other wines or, or insert, you know, like the Kindia Wiley, it's not an expensive or hard process. You can just get into it if, if you're willing to spend a little bit of time learning and, and, and doing so that's where all the joy is, right? I mean, aren't we supposed to keep learning as we go? I think that, that's I important. hope so. I mean, I yeah. want my life to keep getting bigger rather than Me too. smaller. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I think there's an art to that. I, I think that that is harder to do than one might hope. Oh yeah. No, I agree with you. I agree with you. It's easy to get pigeonholed by your job. So you have a, a project with Carla uh, that it's, I think it's titled An Approach to Relaxation. That's true. Okay. So, and it's, there's some wines and yep. I'm curious about the, I'm curious about the name. Um, so, you know, we've been down this road of naming, I guess I've been a part of now four different wine companies that we've started from nothing. And naming is always a funny, a funny thing. Um, and with this, you know, we're not, we make a tiny, tiny little bit of wine from a very, very special place, which happens to also be very, very small. Um, and it, it can just be us. You know, we're not trying to say, you know, horsehead bookends or some name that some, some creative agency would think up and, you know, end up in case stacks in a Safeway or a Total Wine somewhere. That's that's not what this project's about. Um, and so it's, I, I think it's part and parcel with um, our desire to just live every day in a positive way and, and have fun and enjoy ourselves and do work that we care about. Um, how we got to that exact title uh, is so is sort of interesting. Um, Carla had been carrying around these these uh, gentlemen's magazines that were yeah, from the 1950s, um, and when we were looking for an image for um, the red wine, you know, Dennis Scholl, my first partner, and I had done um, you know proper art, if you will, with contemporary artists. And, um, and that was exciting, but yeah, that was the province of Betz and Scholl and, and Carla and I wanted to do something different, but something that really embodied this very voluptuous, you know, ripe strawberry thing that our wine always gives. And on the cover of this gent magazine from, I think it's 1959, it's around here somewhere, um, is this very luscious pair of lips biting an ear and, uh, we're like, oh my God, that's it. So we blew it up and chopped it up and obscured it a bit. Um, spoke to the people at Gent Magazine. They're like, yeah, yeah, no, that's we're different owners. It's public domain. Do your thing. Um, and a tagline under the title of Gent Magazine is an approach to relaxation. And I'm like, okay, that's oh, just perfect. I didn't know that. <laughs> so okay. it's completely, it's completely appropriated and completely appropriate to our project. I love that. I love that. Yeah. I mean, we, Heidi, we we came up with so many stupid names. Sorry to change it. Who's like? <laughs> More waffles, please, was one in the running. Like, you know, I'll have the waffles. Because we're just imagining, like, people with a wine list at the Little Nell or some other fancy joint. Yeah, yeah, I'll have the waffles. Like, yeah, perfect. I definitely want to hear someone say that. In the end, we feel like commercially that would have been a bad idea. I do love waffles, though. And mm -hmm. I was the out best. to breakfast, yeah, with Rashid Johnson in New York last spring. And I ordered the waffles. And uh -huh. he was obsessed with the fact that I ordered waffles. And he kept saying, who orders waffles? I, I can't believe you ordered waffles. You ordered waffles? And I said, yeah, I have a waffle maker. I make waffles at home. Sometimes we have breakfast for dinner. Yes. And that's my favorite thing to do. Well, I love that. Favorite, but, but a it's favorite thing them. to do amongst the favorite things to do. So I 
ordered and sent him a waffle maker to his studio. And oh, yes. he <laughs> was just beside himself thrilled with that. Oh, so fun. I can I can see the allure of I'll take the waffles yes. as a company <laughs> name. Totally. <laughs> Those 2014 waffles, please. <laughs> Aged waffles at something. So good. You've talked about this idea of making life a party. Mm-hmm. Not all parties are fun, but they should be. Yeah. That what do you comes think about to, that? Yeah, well, that comes back to why we choose where we want to live. I mean, there are plenty of, again, obligatory parties. Um, I've had enough of those. I'm, I'm going to try to never go to another so one of those in my people. life. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and there's an obligatory outfit, and there's an obligatory seating arrangement. And it's like, you know what? I There's... I have other things I want to accomplish, you know, and if uh, it take me a lot to get me to one of those, that's be about a cause I, I deeply, deeply care about and not just um, the social season and specific addresses around the, the world. I, I, I don't have, I have no interest whatsoever. Um, me, so I'll interrupt you for a second and, and ask yeah. you what, what would fall in that category of something that you deeply, deeply care about? Hmm. It's a great question. Um, largely environmental causes, um, children, education, um, hunger. And now um, I, I'm, I've become um, very interested in um, criminal justice reform. And um, I'm, it's, it's, a, it's it's a fledgling interest, but I'm, I'm just beginning to learn about um, some of the college programs that are going to are that are being taught. Um, in the prisons around the country, um, you know, that, that was once common. And then of course it got rolled back in 94 by Clinton and Congress. He wasn't the good man. We all think he was, um, charming, but didn't do good things necessarily better than the alternative. I will say that. Um, but you know, that, that's a, these people that are incarcerated, it's supposed to be a correctional system and, and there's no correctional thing happening there at all. It's just, it's a penal system, actually, um, and and that I find that deeply disturbing um, and really saddening. Um, but you know, th- there's so many causes, and and I found you just have to you just have to pick one and dig in. I would say um, it's been it, it can be dizzying, you know, if you just look at all the things that need attention. Um, but for me, it, it's been great to with each of the businesses dig in and and commit to something. Um, and maybe that can be something that happens in tangent with your, your learning as you're growing the business, um, or you can do it with your own time. And so um, I, w- I would use an example. I just sold my mezcal company uh, very recently, and you know, we were working in Oaxaca for 15 years. Um, and Oaxaca is very trendy now, but if you go back to 2005 and you mentioned the word mezcal, um, as I did, people said, oh, you're going to go to jail. Like, well, why? It's like, well, mescaline's illegal. It's like, no, 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 it's not mescaline, right? <laughs> and, and no one thought about that corner of the world. No one cared. And and um, and as we dug in and, and we learned about, um, again, I, I, as I noted, I like to make things, um, and I like to make them as, as well as possible. Um, we found that it's a really dirty industry. Um, and as you get to know the communities, there it's not – it's it's a tough place for kids, no matter who they are, but um, particularly young girls. And so we we did a number of initiatives from um, first endowing a library in the town where we worked to um, sponsoring after school education. Um, so there were dance classes and photography classes, and, and both folkloric dance and break dancing, which was really cool. Um, as well as teaching, we funded the, the education of written and spoken Spanish, English, and Zapotec, a you know, native language there. And we were able to do that all as a part of, of our own um, growing presence in the community. And, you know, that feels good. You know, just to go there and, and, and do, do nothing other than your work is, I think, very, very selfish. Um, you know, the world is, is smaller, and it is a global community. And, and so when I, I think about here, I am in Amsterdam as a part of the quote-unquote problem, driving up housing prices and it's crowded what have you and at this by the same time i feel like well you know that's just the way the world is but hopefully i can be here and and contribute somehow and so when we went to rural mexico rural southern mexico oaxaca to work same story like okay 
let's how how can we contribute? And but then more than just making a handout, I think you have to look at how you can change things systemically. And so as we learned so much about mezcal production, um, we learned that there's a boatload of waste. And this is kind of a cool thing for anyone listening to think about. For any bottle of of distilled alcohol, meaning vodka, gin, whiskey, mezcal, tequila, imagine 12 more bottles of liquid waste. And that's what it takes to make the one you get to drink. Because essentially, I mean, it's distillation. So you're distilling something of low alcohol. You're pulling out the alcohol itself, right? And you're leaving all the other liquid behind. And so for every bottle of Jack Daniels, well, there's 12 more of some noxious liquid. And, and I'm not saying Jack Daniels in particular, but and pick it. Pick your, your alcohol. There's 12 more, just like it, of liquid waste that has to be attended to. And if you're in rural Oaxaca, that just gets poured into the rivers. And what it does in the case of mezcal waste is it's highly acidic and it's oxygen-starved. So it pulls out all the oxygen, of course, from the river, which then means no more fish because they need the oxygen. So there's no more life. There's kind of funny slimes, but so so you kill all the life, you acidify the river, so people can't drink it any longer. They still have to bathe in it because that's what it is. Um, but if you're not going to drink the water, you're going to drink something that comes in a bottle. And are you going to convince a kid to drink, you know, a bottle of Penafiel water, or is he going to get a Coca Cola out of you? Well, for sure, the Coca Cola is happening, which then brings all kinds of other issues: diabetes, you know, weight issues. And then you have an empty bottle, and there's no such thing as a recycling program in so many of these communities. You know, they just go into the landfill, and when the landfill's full, you just light it on fire, right, and do it all over again. So, we we dug deep on this and, and figured out how to turn all the waste into um, actually adobe bricks. And the the first schoolhouse I went to in Arizona was an adobe brick schoolhouse in in Tucson in 1973. And, um, you know, adobe is a big part of the architecture in the, in the desert southwest. And we figured out how to take the liquid and the fiber and dirt and make bricks, which have then been used to rebuild houses and do public works projects. And and at first we were met with resistance. People were like, well, you're creating more work for us. And I was like, no, no, no. Like, look what we're doing. You know, this is really amazing. And the rivers can be healthy again and they won't smell terrible. And you have a water source and, and so on and so forth. Um, and so that was really exciting. And I guess that's, again kind of a long-winded answer of of you know you, you got to figure out a way to give back um to the people to the planet so to whatever you care about that is so exciting yeah because as i was listening to you talk about the challenges of the 12 bottles and then the diabetes and all these you know largely unintended consequences right yeah. it was starting to feel like an insurmountable problem. Yeah. But then in that place of being overwhelmed or, you know, filled with, you know, frustration or despair, then there's the genesis for a super creative, yeah, completely contributory solution. Yeah. Isn't it cool? It's amazing. Beyond. Yeah. Beyond so cool. um the one of I mean there are several native populations in that part of Mexico, including um, Zapotec, Mistec, and Mije. And um, we met a, a young um, engineer, Martha, who's Mije. And she now runs the Sombra Palenque, which is the distillery. And last December, she accepted an award on behalf of Sombra Mezcal at the Mexican consulate in Washington, D.C., uh, for leading the way for environmental stewardship um, of the industry. And it's just, it's so cool. So it went from being completely, um, you know, a well, gigantic mess. And, and now the, the government's looking at it like, okay, this is, this is actually how we can change the future and make this thing sustainable. It's, it's just so cool. Yeah. One of the other projects we are doing is a, is a very fun new project in Mexico. Um, so the, the parent um, identity is called the Casa Comos Beverage Group. And, and underneath that, um, it really is my dream job. I just get to innovate and and play. Um, so we're we're we've started a tequila company called Comos, and Comos was a Greek uh, mythical figure um, responsible for nocturnal dalliance, and basically was a party guy. Um, and so we're we're making uh, tequila like it's never been made before, um, and that's one of the companies. And the other. It's something called Superbird, and um, I'm, I'm actually drinking one now, not Superbird. I'm drinking a Paloma, uh, which is probably my favorite drink, so it's tequila and pink grapefruit juice, a little agave nectar and sparkling water. 
And we figured out it took seven years, but we're putting that in a can. And of course, the Paloma translating to be the dove, we're calling it Superbird. Uh, and it'll actually be where you're sitting in Scottsdale in about four weeks, the very first bits of it. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm making beverages in Mexico as well as in Australia. It's super fun. So how come the first one is coming to Scottsdale? Um, that's a great question. So uh, it's a great place to do it. And the, there, you, you look at these things in so many ways. Um, and, you know, the obvious first one everyone talks about is demographic. Um, it's not the overriding factor. Um, you look at seasons. You look at the way people consume things. You look at you know where they consume things. Um, you look at density of population. You look at you know shipping. There, there's so many so many things that you look at, and um, those are those are things that are not in my first order of fun. But um, again, I get to do what I want to do, and so there are things I I, I do pay attention to. Um, and so Arizona matters. You know, there, it's a, it's one of the, you know, I think top eight tequila uh, consuming states. So they understand what it's about. Um, it is close to Mexico, which is advantageous for shipping. There is money. There is density. There is a lot of outdoor sports. I mean, when I was growing up there, I think there were more. I, I this this could have been a myth, but amongst Arizonans, the fact um, was was stated as there are more registered boats in Arizona than any other state in the nation. Which, if you think about that, for a landlocked desert estate, that's a crazy thing. But then if you look around at all the lakes, you think, well, this actually might be true. <laughs> so, and, and all the people. Um, so anyways, those are, that's a, those are some very, very boring reasons um, for why we're going to Arizona. But, but it is, it'll be there soon. And what will the cans look like? They're so beautiful. I'll send you a photograph. Um, okay. There's, you know, uh, I mean, I guess I just say it, everyone call it the, the very, very overused skull and a dove and a scarab beetle and a snake, and it all has symbology. Um, but, you know, we, we messed around with so many different things. Um, and in the end, we gave it to a tattoo artist in, um, we worked at a creative agency called Dando. They're great, very small agency. And, um, which I like, and I'm not a big fan of big agencies, but we, we worked with a small agency and then they found a, a tattoo artist in New York and just said, just draw something great. And they just killed it. And it's in part of me, they just crushed it. It's so, so good. Um, so yeah, it's very beautiful. It, it looks a little um, edgy, but not too edgy. Uh, yeah, I mean, we have um, a, a few investors who have all said, oh, my God, it's so beautiful. I'm going to get it tattooed on myself. <laughs> like, great, please do. <laughs> I, so somehow we'll see how knew, that I somehow knew that you were going to say that a tattoo artist had drawn it. <laughs> and I was wondering about that. Yep. Do you talk, if you will, a little bit about your tattoos and yeah. I don't know, maybe a story or two of, you know, a few of them. Definitely. I mean, I, I, you know, my first one was, well, it's been almost, it was probably 15 years ago now. I mean, mind you, I'm 49. So um, what have you, but so it wasn't an early thing and I wouldn't call it a mistake, you know, by any stretch of imagination, but it was just a B, the letter B inside of my left arm is there which has now grown to be be nice but at the time i just put a b in there um and i didn't even think about what everyone would say they said oh b for bets i was like well yeah that's my last name but i didn't think about that at all not one bit it would be for be nice be kind be present be thoughtful benevolent you know all of these things that i i have these little things i say to myself over and over and over again i'm a big believer in in practice and and that was just a reminder basically to be kind um, so I stuck that in there. And then um, my left arm is now completely full, but they're all with little things that have all come together. Um, one on the bottom side of my forearm is a squid, and the squid is pulling, is a cartoon squid, grabbing a ring of calamari out of a, in a you know, the, the typical uh, Italian red plastic basket with the red and white check paper. And he's grabbing a, a ring of fried calamari 
Um, and that's because I asked my wife, Carla, to marry me, actually, with a piece of fried calamari at Union Square Cafe in New York City. Um, I didn't even know it when I ordered the, the calamari. It just showed up, and I took a hot piece and stuck it on her finger and said, will you marry me? And she said yes, and ate it off her finger. And so, <laughs> I can remember what said. So it's a little goofy. Um, I got one in Or Argentina. like the most romantic story ever. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, I mean, I have The Lady and the Tramp. I don't know if you've seen this one. Hang on a second. They're, you can see oh, them. Yeah. They're sharing They're sharing the piece of spaghetti. Yeah. Um, and then my, I think a recent favorite, it's just my own handwriting. Um, I scribbled it on a notepad and then had them turn it into a stencil. And this guy gave it to me in Buenos Aires recently, which is never stop dreaming. And, um, that's a big one for me. That's how I pick myself up. You know, what, what, as we were talking about, we all those dark moments and, you know, I, I would be a liar if I didn't say they, they don't come at some point every day, but you know, you get better and better at turning them away more and more quickly. And for me, it's just keep training. Keep, what do you want to do? What's fun? What's fun? And, and um, so that's a tattoo. It's, it's on the inside of my right arm, and I see it nonstop, which is deliberate. I wanted to ask you about how you decide what you want to do next, how you figure out what you're interested in. And yeah. that's maybe the the kind of perfect segue, you know, is it, is it a question of like, what is what's fun, the essence of, of how you figure out what's next, or is that part of a larger approach? That's part of, um, it's part of a two part approach. And, you know, I was discussing this this morning with my wife. Um, well, I'll come to that in a second, but I, I, I have articulated it for myself as wanting to always work at the intersection of enthusiasm and opportunity. And so I imagine it like a graph, you know, and the enthusiasm curve flies off to the right, upwards and to the right somewhere. And then the opportunity curve also flies off and to the right. Maybe it doesn't have the same arc. Maybe it has a very different arc. But ideally, you want to work where those two arcs intersect. For example, um, I, I had been at one point in my life very enthusiastic about the idea of Grenache, which is one of my favorite red grapes, as it's grown in Baja, California. So that's an enthusiasm. And if you think about the opportunity, meaning can I do this and like actually make money for my partners, make make a living? It's a it's a total no, right? So you know the enthusiasm curve is way off the chart, and the the opportunity curve is just flat. Um, so don't work there, right? Um, I, I think when you know we started the Mescal project, or when Dennis and I started the wine project, we had enthusiasms that very much intersected with opportunity, um, and and importantly, I don't want, I, I don't I don't need someone else to say yes, that's a good opportunity. I just have to have that conviction myself, or or myself and amongst my business partners. Um, generally. When people, you know, this is now, and several people say this, but when people tell you you're crazy, you know, generally you're onto something. Um, it's, a, it's not an original Richardism, but it's something that I found to be very, very true in my life. Um, and, you know, look at Mescal or look at Grenache. When, we, when Dennis and I started making Grenache, you know, people were like, Grenache, what's a Grenache? And like, or what's in Grenache? It's like, no, it's its own thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually, at that point in time, it was the most widely planted grape on the planet, and no one even knew it. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. You know, you have to you have to do your own diligence on the opportunity curve, um, and so that's how I do it. It's it's literally that simple. It's two parts, and then um, I, I do want to acknowledge something with that Heidi, which is uh, there, that's also a compromise. You know, um, it's not a horrible compromise. It's like oh shucks, well I'll do this instead of Grenache in, in Mexico. No, that's not the case at all. It's, it's not like that, but. But I am definitely not throwing pottery, you know. I'm I'm making tequila, and and I love doing it. I mean, and the the new one is going to be something the world has never seen before, and and that doesn't in and of itself make it good, but it means we've we've done some thinking and and come up with with something that inspires us, and and it, you know, look, if no one else drinks it, we'll drink it all, and, and I'm good at that. I, I throw a good party, but. Um, 
you know, somewhere in there, I just want to communicate that it's not a free for all. It's not just like, oh, this is fun. We can do it. It's like, well, there are lots of fun things. And, and then, you know, on the other, on the other shoulder, they think that like angel, devil, animal thing. And the other, on the other shoulder, you think like, well, you can't do it all anyways. Right. So if you can't do it all anyways, pick the smart enthusiasms. Right. No, that's how I decide. I think that is such a good motto. Pick the smart enthusiasm. Right. Yeah. So let me just ask you before we end, why do you think art matters? Oh, I mean, it's the vibrancy of life, isn't it? I mean, it is. It's, I, I you know, well, we could talk about this for another long time, but, you know, in short, um, it's, it's the humanity. It's, you know, that people have a pulse, you know, that people care, you know, that they're alive, that they're suffering, that they're thriving, that they're loving, that they're upset about something. And that can happen, of course, in, you know, painting, photography, and so on and so forth, but it also happen in music and in cooking and in just the way you wake up and comport yourself. Like, why can't your life be art? You know, I, I think that that's, that's what I tell myself is wake up and make it good and, and tell myself I get to do this instead of I have to do this. There's an art to that too. Um, you know, that's not consumed by other people so much, but um, yeah, I don't know. Art, art is the, the, the pulse of humanity to me. Thank you so much. Of it's such I a pleasure. You. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love seeing you. It's nice to see you too. It's a treat. It's a real treat. Yeah. Conversations about art is part of HiZ.art, a multi platform project that connects all to art through a podcast series, books, talks program, brand collaborations, TV, and more. This episode was produced by Simon Illa. Our theme music was composed by Eric McDougall. Blake Migdon assists with social media content editing. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and review us on whichever platform you listened, as it helps us further our goal of connecting all to art. We will be back again every Tuesday with new episodes. Thanks so much for listening.